Dun, 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 dun. We are live, everyone, for a new episode of the Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintraub. And to, today, we are on the regular time, a regular spot. How are you doing, Seth? Feels good to be home, sleeping in my yes. own bed. Yes, it does. All right, we have plenty of news to discuss this week. Um, nothing super major, but a lot of uh, interesting stuff if you're a hardcore AV fan. Uh, so we'll, we'll get right into it, starting with um, one story that raises a lot of highbrows. What's happening with that is uh, earlier this week, Tesla uh, removed the uh, cheapest Model Y, the Texas-built Model Y, the Model Y all-wheel drive, the Model Y 46 ADI, however you want to name it. Um, Remove it from the configurator. It's not available for sales anymore. Uh, and it's not like what happened last year with the Model 3 long range where Tesla like graded out of the of the options where you cannot you couldn't click on it, couldn't order it, but it was still there. Uh, as like we know it's it's an option out there. Now it's just gone from the online configurator. So why? Well, of course, we reached out to Tesla's PR department, and then they, nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do that. Uh, that's funny. Uh, we have to speculate, then that's what happens. And uh, speculation, well, a few things right now. For the whole week, it looks like Gigafactory Texas was shut down uh, production-wise. Uh, sorry, let me uh, put my do not disturb on. Oh, sorry. It's not working. And um, the production has been shut down. Now, like if it was a temporary shutdown, like I don't necessarily see the, the need to remove it from the configurator. You can still take orders. That's, that's still a useful thing to do. So I don't know if it explains that exactly. Uh, of course, the factory shutdown uh, is itself speculated for different reasons, like uh, especially the Cybertruck. We think that uh, Tesla might be shutting down in order to focus some of its resources towards bringing um, Cybertruck production to to a, a real start. Um, we know that they've been doing batches of uh, release candidates, but uh, they should, uh, uh, from what we are hearing from suppliers, production should start fully in October. So that's just a few weeks away. So it would make sense that... Uh, and some things are brewing within the factory. But yeah, other than that, it's it's not clear why they would remove the Model Y. Uh, a lot of people also have been speculating that the Model Y refresh would be coming because of the Model 3. Uh, we haven't heard any serious sources on that, though. Uh, it's, just, it's just rumors, and Model Y is a lot more recent, still selling very well. Would it make sense to have a significant upgrade? Not really. Do you have any uh, other theories set on this? I mean, I obviously Cybertruck's a big deal around those parts. It's probably due to that. I don't think there's going to be like a Highland version of the Model Y coming out of Texas anytime soon. Me neither. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm in full agreement with you there. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not going to be permanent by any means, right? Like they're going to be. They're not going to just take over. Cybertruck is not going to just take over Texas, right? It's, they're still going to make Model Ys there. Yeah, I would assume they still would. It was a big investment in the production line there. They just recently brought it up to 5,000 units a week, uh, even though there's been rumors that it's like, slowed down a bit since. So I don't know. I mean, Elon announced it at the last conference call or earnings call that, that there would be factory upgrades without going to the details. So And those factory upgrades would... Uh, result in factory shutdown. So we're seeing what we're seeing now. But again, like there's other, the, 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 there have been other factory shutdowns at Tesla in the past that didn't result in removing a vehicle completely out of the lineup. However, there hasn't been that many vehicles that were just produced a single factory other than Model S and X. So this this is the Texas build Model Y, even though there's the Texas also builds other Model Ys with the 2170 cells also. Um, we have no mix of that, unfortunately, so we don't know exactly what's happening in details, but uh, maybe we get uh, an update on that in the next uh, earnings calls because uh, Drew Beck, you know, have been, has, been, has been pretty good about that, about like going quite granular, especially with the 4680 production. Maybe if he could elaborate on the next call about where are those cells going? Are they going uh, in the new Model Y? Are they going for the Cybertruck? Because uh, that's, that's another... Um, 
potential factor. So Rodrigo Jimenez here in the, on LinkedIn says might be a supply chain issue. And it might be like an internal supply chain issue where like Tesla might be shutting down the 4680 production of the Model Y to keep all those 4680 cells for the Cybertruck. That's that's a possibility too. That's so. true. Yep. Because we know they've been ripping that up, but have they ramped that up enough that like they can support production of uh, like these That's right. And the Cybertruck is not going to have the 2170s, right? I, I would assume not. I would assume it makes so, no sense to have both of them. So maybe they're just stockpiling for that ramp up. That that's mm -hmm. true because there's like a mix of 2170s and well, then they would just go back to the 2170s on the Model Y. I don't know. Mm -hmm. While we're still talking about Giga Texas, I'll jump to this story right here that came out yesterday. Uh, was interesting. It's uh, some uh, employment data coming from Jason, Jason Shawhan, Tesla's director of manufacturing at Giga Texas. He did a public uh, presentation that was uh, reported by the Austin Business Journal, and he, he revealed some employment data at Giga Factory Texas that were quite unbelievable to me, honestly. Um, he revealed that at the end of last year, Tesla had 12,000 employees at Giga Factory Texas, which is already high, already uh, is like more employees than most factories around the world, um, already at the same level of Tesla's other giant factories like Giga Nevada, Fremont, and, and uh, I don't know about Shanghai exactly what's the kind of employment right out there. But that's nothing. That was at the end of last year. He says now that Tesla employs about 20,000 people in the Austin area, which I would assume that most of it is at the factory. Um, so a single factory with 20,000 employees is just in, like unbelievable. But then he goes with an even wilder claim where he says that when Cybertruck production is going to be fully ramped up, which who knows when, when that's going to be, but he expects Tesla to have 60,000 employees around Gigafactory, Texas. That's, uh, that's a small city. <laughs> yeah, people. I mean, I was thinking it's like a like a big football stadium worth of people. Yeah, that's, you can visualize like that, yeah. Like a college football stadium in Texas, which is popular there. <laughs> yeah, Austin. So, so the, Texas is used to the logistic of having sixty thousand people at the same time. Of course, this is on several shifts. Obviously, there's not not everyone is there, but there's some logic to Gigafactory Texas having so many employees, which is it's more than just vehicle production. Now, of course, once you have Cyber, cyber Truck all ramp up, so you have a factory producing. We know that Tesla aims for three, over 300,000 vehicles a year. So that alone is a significant truck factory that, there that is normal to have over 10,000 employees just for that. But then, then you have the Model Y uh, production line also. But then you also have much deeper uh, granular production of uh, components, mainly the 4680 cells that we've been talking about. So normally that's a whole other factory by itself. Employ and uh, at the level that Tesla wants to produce to, if they want to produce there all the cells for the Cybertruck and, and the Model Y and sounds like a new generation vehicle is going to be built there too, um, then that that's a giant factory also. And then Tesla is even, is even, uh, even has a cathode factory at the, at the plant too. That's also a giant factory uh, in itself. So Tesla Gigafactory Texas is like multiple factories at the same time. I would have assumed that eventually it would ramp up to 20,000 employees. I didn't think that it would already have 20,000 employees and aim for 60,000 employees. That's just, that's yeah, just madness. And, and this isn't going to contribute to the headcount a ton, but it is also the HQ. Yeah, that's fair. It's the so. HQ. Uh, they've moved a lot of engineering teams there too and built new ones, a new video game team, and new like the others. So it's not, we, when we say Gigafire Texas, like a lot of them I'm sure works there, but I know te Tesla has other offices around and they are building other buildings also on this giant campus because the, the, the building that you see on screen right now with the Tesla logo on, uh, written in solar panels on top, uh, that's that's the main Giga factory, but the, like the cattle factory is a separate building, and and we expect other buildings to show up too for Tesla's uh, um, other departments. Even though the core engineering team Tesla wants it within the factory on the production lines. Did for... you say video game team? Yeah. Like implementing other people's video games or building their. Own? Uh, yeah, I think it's more integration of the the video games into the the, the Tesla OS. Yeah. That would be an interesting story. Yeah, I did write that story. That uh, no, but like a, if they're a year doing ago. their own video games, 
Oh yeah, yeah. If they do their own, yeah. I don't, I don't think that this doesn't get into that. So you never know. <laughs> you, you remember when uh, we first reported like Jim Keller being hired, and they were like, they're, they're not, they're not hiring Jim Keller to to do a chip, right? They're not going to do their own silicone. Right. That's insane. And then they did. Remember when they were going to do a uh, music streaming service? Yeah, when that that's too. Gone. I don't know. I think, I think that like. Yeah, they Spotify realize like works. Spotify is actually pretty good at what they do. I'm a big fan of Spotify to be honest. Like I think their algorithm is like one of the best. Like they are yeah. the if you if you use the app right, like they suggest you some incredible stuff. Like anyway, moving on. Yep. Another little Nax update. Uh, Jaguar signed up to be the next automaker to adopt Nax in. Uh, North America, they signed a deal with Tesla. So, so it seems to be like part of why it's getting slow a little bit. For uh, we, we we don't we have like a steady stream of automakers being announced, and that like everyone is jumping on board at the same time. It's like all these automakers they want to have a deal with Tesla first to get access to that supercharger network, not to be left behind in the transition to Nax. So even though Nax is our open standard. Currently being standardized by SAE, Tesla also gave a license to uh, forget the, the UK manufacturer of electronics to, to build it. So Tesla is not even like now the sole supplier of the connector. So much on its own standardization, you wouldn't necessarily need to deal with Tesla to move to Nax. But for automakers that already have a lineup of electric vehicles offered, uh, it's the what's the effect again? Announcing new features that Osborne. Sales. Osborne effect. Thank you very much. Keep forgetting that as well. I keep, I keep want to see the Streisand effect, but I know that's not that's completely different, right? Different, <laughs> uh, but awesome. The, also interesting. Uh, the Osborne effect, like they don't want to, to people not to buy the current vehicles because they won't get access to supercharger network. So they need that deal. They need that uh, adapter, and that's exactly the deal that Jaguar did. Talking about 2024, an adapter coming. Uh, to the current lineup. And then the new Jaguars, the new electric vehicle from Jaguars, which uh, they very much need after the kind of the fiasco. I don't, well, I don't know if it's a harsh, too harsh of a word fiasco, but like the I Pace was um, a dud a little bit. Like it was nice at first. It was like a new, in, a new interesting entry, but they never significantly updated it. It was, it went past its time. And then obviously there was the uh, battery issue that uh, uh, they suffered. Uh, with the, the fire risk. So they very much need a new generation of electric vehicle. And uh, the new generation in North America is going to be back uh, by Nax. So now we have Ford, Honda, Mercedes-Benz, Nissan, GM, Volvo, Polestar, Rivian, and Jaguar all on board with Nax. Not that many left. Well, a couple. Yeah, a few. People keep talking about Lucid. Like, Lucid needs to get on board. I don't know what's... Uh... I thought Lucid, I think Lucid's on board. Oh, did they? Did they announce it? I think they did. I missed it. All right. Let's talk a little bit about Tesla custom software. That's interesting. It's happening. Tesla announced this week that they have this new update for all Earth's uh, Tesla rental vehicles in North America, where they have this new software in car, custom software in car that allows customers to directly link their Tesla account with the new vehicle that they're renting. And you could already do that already if Hertz would get involved because Hertz had to basically send you an access to via email to the specific vehicle and then you would get it to your, uh, your phone. That would work. But I guess it was a little bit too hard to manage for them. So Tesla has now a custom software solution, which you see on the screen. You have the QR code appearing right here. You scan that, gets you to your app, to your um, Tesla app on your phone, and automatically adds it to your vehicles for the duration of your rental, which is awesome because now you can use it as uh, you can use your phone as a key. Don't have to manage the suboptimal uh, key card entry. And obviously, you also enjoy all the other features that come with the, the, the Tesla app. So this, is, this isn't obviously a good feature, but I think what makes it even more interesting is Tesla now opening up to the idea of having custom in-car software for specific application 
in this case, obviously, it's the one that makes the most sense because Hertz is a significant customer of Tesla now with the 100,000 vehicle order. I don't know how many exactly have been delivered already, but we know as of last year was at least 50,000. So, um, yeah, it makes sense to, to to put some little effort to make it easier, especially now that uh, it looks like Hertz is locked in as a big fan of Tesla. They say that uh, Tesla vehicles, when they rent them, it, it increased their, their own, uh, Hertz own customer satisfaction. Like customers like the idea of uh, renting a Tesla vehicle from them, and that will make probably the experience even smoother. So once uh, when their Hertz needs to update their fleet again, which is very often, they probably. Uh, I'd see, I would see them sticking with Teslas, even though they also added some Polestar. And... Yeah, they have a bunch of EVs, but um, yeah. nothing compared to like the, the number of Teslas. At, and yeah. I think the Teslas are at almost every place versus other EVs are only at places where there's like a lot of EV infrastructure. Like, for instance, in the South, they, the Hertz, you know, in Birmingham, Alabama, probably does not have anything... Uh, besides no, the Tesla, the Tesla charging infrastructure in Birmingham is not bad. Like they have a few. No, that, that's what I'm saying. They only have Teslas. Oh, they only have Birmingham. Tesla. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Okay, okay, yeah. Miss, uh, they don't have any pole stars there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now, still sticking with custom software inside Tesla vehicle, even though not necessarily from Tesla, uh, but we've heard that Tesla is working on that too. We had Larry Hellison. Uh, was uh, until recently was a Tesla board member and a close friend of Elon Musk. He's very well aware of what's going on at Tesla, uh, but he's obviously more well known for being the the, the founder of uh, Oracle. And he's still, uh, even though he's in the seventies, he's still a CTO and, and executive chairman of uh, Oracle. And he, he did the keynote presentation at uh, Oracle's Cloud World 2023 conference and the Cybertruck made an appearance. Uh, Larry said, "Our next generation police car, police car, while showing that image, is coming very soon. It's my favorite police car. You know, it's my favorite car. Actually, it's Elon's favorite car. It's incredible. I know too much about it. Some still to be disclosed, but amongst other things, it's incredibly safe, very fast. It's got a stainless steel body, and also he said that uh, it they are." So during the presentation, and right before that, he was unveiling the latest generation of Oracle as law enforcement software. So they have Oracle does some of the software that you see in police car. Obviously, you don't see in police car unless you're unless you're maybe in a ride along or something. <laughs> but, no, you're in the back seat. Uh, yeah, yeah, but in the back seat, uh, they have these yep. these uh, these screens that have all their software that interacts with their dispatch and uh, and, and whatnot. And they, 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 these things are getting very smart and they use uh, artificial intelligence while not even though there's some controversy around that. And um, now he was talking about implementing it in, in the cyber truck specifically. And they say that they are working to use the in-car screens and camera system in the vehicle. So they wouldn't even have to add anything to the vehicle. They could have their own software in there, which is new information. Like I said, the Tesla is not big on like letting third parties getting involved in their in-car software. But if someone is going to do it, I would think Oracle would make the most sense because of how close Elon is with, with uh, Ellison. But not only that, what's interesting is that uh, Tesla had previously talked about that too, specifically for law enforcement, where they said that they were uh, looking to work directly, especially I think, I remember the UK, uh, they were talking when, when Tesla developed their own vehicle to be certified for UK law enforcement. Uh, they talk about custom law enforcement software within the vehicle. So it's possible here that Ellison was like teasing at uh, the Oracle working directly with Tesla on the Cybertruck being a, a law enforcement vehicle, which in the U.S. makes sense. I think especially in the South, I saw a lot of pickup trucks being police vehicles, right? Like uh, you don't see that as much in, in the Northeast, but. No, uh, but I've seen a whole lot more uh, SUVs. I mean, it used to be a, a sedan, it was a P police cruiser, mm -hmm. and now almost every one I see is an SUV of some sort. Yeah. Still sticking to Tesla custom software. This is an interesting one here. Tesla launches the wall connector app integration. And um, it's one of those that I saw a lot of people commenting, like, why, well, why was it not already available? Because you didn't need to, because the Tesla car was always 
the one doing the connectivity stuff when it comes to charging. Everything you could do with a uh, connectivity-wise with the Tesla chargers, you could do with a Tesla car, and all Tesla cars, uh, all Tesla chargers were charging Tesla cars for the most part. But for years now, since I think the, the second generation wall connector, uh, the wall connector has had Wi-Fi capability. It just wasn't really being used because of what I just said. Uh, but now that Tesla is opening up the, uh, the chargers to other uh, EVs, especially in North America, and now specifically that they have the new uh, universal wall connector that uh, can work with virtually any electric vehicles in North America, then you have uh, a different opportunity now to enable those uh, connectivity at the charging station rather than the vehicle so that you can take advantage of things like scheduling charging and, and monitoring charging and, and, and those uh, uh, charging history features and all that. So that's exactly what they're doing. So how you do it is as simple as um, having a Tesla account, going to uh, the Tesla app and setting up a new wall connector uh, or an existing one on it, you tap had product and then you stand the QR code in your quick start guide in your wall connector. And then you can control your wall connector on your app like you can any other Tesla product. So if you're charging a non-Tesla vehicle, you can control the charging experience from your Tesla app rather than on the app of the uh, vehicle if there is. I assume that's the thing. Um, I didn't do it because I don't have to because I only have Teslas here. Yeah, I imagine most people won't even ever. Yeah, know. most Tesla owners. I mean, you can you can still do it and just I don't know to have it in your app. But all again, I would assume all the features, unless there's something that they had in the futures. But right now, all the features are only uh, uh, only charging schedule and charging history. So. This is things that you already have in yeah. the app, uh, in the Tesla app. All right, this was interesting. A new study from Recurrent, and we, we like the Recurrent studies because they are the pretty good, at least data-wise. Um, they have access to a lot of data on Tesla vehicles directly on the batteries. We reported our story from them a few weeks ago, about or a month ago, about the superchargers. Uh, frequent supercharging versus non-frequent supercharging, how it affects battery longevity. And, and we it confirms something that we knew for a while that it didn't actually have a negative effect long-term, unless maybe ultra-excessive supercharging, but that's another thing in itself. Now, they looked into the effect of cold climate on battery longevity. So obviously, we all know that a colder temperatures, a uh, harsher climate, affects negatively your range, your real-time range for a bunch of different reasons. Um, but what about the longevity of the battery? How does it affect battery degradation, energy degradation over time? And that's what they found that was interesting is that colder climates are actually better slightly for longevity than uh, warmer climate. So that's... Uh, that's an interesting twist here, not by a giant margin. So they have something recurrent they call the range score, which is basically the uh, energy retention of your battery pack. So a range score of 95, which is what they were getting in those colder climate and coastal climate too, because it goes all the way to California, but on the, on the coastal side rather than the harsher, warmer uh, desert side. Um, so it gets a 95. So that means that on average, the cars are retaining 95% of the energy capacity. Now, if you go in the south, like all the U.S. south, all the way up the east coast, uh, Arizona, Texas, they have on average 92, which is 3% uh, lower. Um, so significant enough to be mentioned, but not a giant difference. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I wonder why cold. I mean, I know we used to put batteries in the refrigerator to make make them last longer. I wonder if that's a similar. Really, you did that? Well, I don't remember us like my parents doing it, but my grandparents always had batteries in the refrigerator. Was it like lead acid batteries? Like no, they mean? were. Uh, oh, maybe they. Mm, they were. I mean, they were like Duracell batteries, but they weren't. Oh, okay. uh, Um, moving on. Yeah. 
Uh, the Giga, Giga Texas. So we already covered that. Oh yeah, this year. This year we can talk a little bit about. Um, so it's still that Project 42 thing that originated. We talked about that before. There was apparently a DOG probe around it, the Project 42 that um, Tesla internally had an investigation around uh, about misappropriation of some company resources to order glass, special glass, apparently over a million dollar worth of special glass that was for something, a special project called Project 42 that rumor was that it was related to a house that could have been owned by, uh, that was being built for Elon Musk rather than for the company. And uh, the story was denied by Elon Musk, but denied, I don't like deny because it, you need to read between the lines. Well, what he denied is that he was very clear about, he denied that there's no house, like find the house, it's, okay? Right. And uh, that he doesn't plan to build a house, hasn't built a house, there's no house, he doesn't plan to build a house. That's not a true denial of the actual story because the actual story is that there was a plan to build a house. The, and maybe it never happened, sure, and it could have fell, but the, if, if it was an order place to potentially build a house, it's the, really the only real, if you want to deny that, then that would be a real denial of the actual story. Because what added to this whole thing too, and probably what resulted in now the news story this week, is that the DOG probe has expanded uh, beyond that and is looking at a bunch of perks and transactions between uh, Tesla, Elon, and Elon and, and comp companies controlled by, by Elon Musk. And it's the fact that, the, the, again, the biography came out. And in the biography, it did confirm that last year Elon was looking to build a house in Austin, met with uh, an architect, and draw up plans and everything. So, sure, he confirms now that he didn't go through with it, but he never denied that they actually did that order of glass, which is the, the the main thing that's been discussed in the, those few articles this week. So I, I think that, that in weird. itself is a good example for Tesla fans to look into when, when they just, like, you believe everything Elon Musk said, like, because they jump on that every time, like, we and we've been victim to that ourselves, where Elon jump on one of our stories and, and denies the story. When I'm like, you have to look, what, what are you denying exactly here? Like, because right. he's, uh, he might be some guy, like, he always says that he's a uh, truth absolutist and all that, and all that, and he's all about the truth. And that might very well be, but he's not above uh, playing semantic and like, read between the lines type of thing also i don't know about his free speech absolutism when he's blocking journalists and and no i'm not, like not, not saying free speech i'm the truth absolutist like he said uh, that before he's, uh, he's i think he's like... neither i mean not to get too far off on a, a digression but like that was one of my problems with the book uh we, we, didn't, we haven't really talked about the book but like you know clearly elon has like huge issues with with honesty and the truth and you know all that stuff and a lot of the book was based on you know what elon's like telling of you know like his father stuff and you know the camps he went to and bullies and all that stuff and i'm like well this guy makes up all kinds of stuff all the time that's either half true or you know yeah i think i think that's the point there though they they are and i'm not defending him by the way when i say this uh like they, they're always like not it's not completely a lie like he's just he's in his it own might be based and, in some reality but yeah it's based in some reality but he massage it he's good at massaging the truth to make himself look better in those stories i mean i, I think that's know. it but i guess I, I think in his head he's like i'm telling the truth i think i don't think he's necessarily like intentionally lying i think he's like that he 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 knows how to present it to make himself look better and still being based somewhat on in on the truth. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. I just don't think that Elon needs an anchor in truth to for what he's saying. I mean, I guess he's, you yeah. know, like, hey, I believe that we're gonna have full self-driving at the end of the year. Like, you know, I believe that. You know, that that's a, a big but does he really believe that? Does he like does I he mean, believe? he's admitted before that he, he was wrong in 
he, he, he was he's admitted about he's wrong, yeah. but like then he says in the same breath, he says, "Yeah, but at the end of this year, it's definitely happening." Yeah, you know, so like I don't know if he even knows if he's you know if he's able to tell what's real and what's not real. So that's I mean that's my point with the book that was really frustrating. Mm-hmm. I was like all the like not seventy percent of the book was like single sourced Elon telling of things, and I'm like I don't believe a thing that a guy uh, I don't believe like most of what that guy says, why am I going to believe this book? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Anyway, that's a digression. That's for another day. Yeah. But I thought that thought this new probe was interesting too, because it brings me to, I think we touched it in the last podcast a little bit, but it's this, I'm, I've been growing, especially as a, a Tesla investor myself, been growing increasingly concerned about Elon I, I mean, this this is a small thing. Well, relatively small. It's a million dollars, and I, I know, like the, the Jose says, the guy is a billionaire. He can build a hundred glass as a hundred glass houses. No, sure, I have no problem with Elon building as many glass houses as as he wants. Although I would put it into perspective of him, like saying ah, the owning properties and then the attack vector. I don't hold any property, and I live in the fifty thousand dollar house, and everything is like all right, like. Choose one or the other. Like, like, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't care if he lives in the hundred million dollar house. Like, but well, don't the, go around like boasting the book, about the fact that you don't houses. own any. In the book, he said he sold the houses because his uh, daughter uh, went communist, and he was trying to appease her. Which, uh, okay, uh, I don't know yeah. if that's true or not, but I mean that's not what he said. On the Joe Rogan podcast, when he just sold, when he just was selling them, exactly at the moment he he gave the reason that houses were and any property was an attack vector for for his enemies. Mm-hmm. But maybe he was talking about commun- communist enemies. <laughs> communist, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so two other things with this, like, is the glass house thing? Is that like a big joke? Because you know, throwing stones out of a glass house is that the whole point? And you know, are we talking about a million dollars just for the glass, or is the whole house made of glass? Like it was the, the 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 thing from the book at least it was, he he said something he wanted like something like a chart, a chart of glass coming out of the lake because he has a, a lake property mm-hmm. near Gigafactory Texas where it's a, a farmhouse there and there's a lake on it and he wanted a chart glass that comes out of the lake and he, and there was part of the house that would be underwater part overwater and you could access it from outside the lake. That sounds so it right. was a whole a whole thing. And then apparently he gave up the idea after his accent said that it, it, it sounded more like a hard project than a home. And he, he gave that up. Yeah. Because apparently it's his it's his uh well, I don't know what she is to him, like a Siobhan, Siobhan Zillis, the the, the neural uh, link uh yeah. woman. She she said that he she was the one driving the project, saying that he needed a home for 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 his family, so a home where his family would come, which makes a ton of sense to be honest. Like, good call. Uh, but uh, it sounds apparently- more like a supervillain layer. Yeah, I- exactly. It's not very homey, <laughs> right? No, because I'm sure it would have been cool. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is misappropriating resources from a public company, Tesla, right. uh, w- without like saying what you, you're doing. But so. Beyond that, because I think I think that's obviously a small thing, and and oh yeah, and to add to the people that saying that oh yeah, again, Elon denied it, denied. I, I don't think his deny was a strong one. But beyond that, in that latest report that came out this week, uh, they confirmed that um, a, a company called Peninsula LLC agreed to reimburse Tesla over the expenses about that project, so specifically that Project Forty Two thing. And uh, also, forty-two is the answer of uh, uh, Shocker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, right. Elon's favorite book. So uh, it would be. It, it sounds like it has a lot to do with Elon that project, yeah. whatever it is. Uh, and that that company, Peninsula LLC, is controlled by uh, Jared Burchall, which was known to be some Elon's personal like money manager type person. I don't know what's exactly his his official title is, but he managed the loan's money basically. It's personal money. Yeah. So yeah, it looks bad, uh, that itself. But beyond that, I think what looks even worse is when Elon goes to uh one of his top autopilot engineer at Tesla amid a critical time to deliver full self-driving 
and he tries to recruit him to come work at Twitter. Uh, that that is ugh, that hurts me bad. Uh, I, uh, it doesn't bodes well, I think. And then at the same time, you hear uh, he didn't talk about that publicly, but in the book, again, he goes on. There's a section where at the end of the book, he meets. Walter in a top secret where he says like Walter cannot even like record the, the conversation and all that. But Walter tried to recall the conversation as best as he can. And he said that Elon was explaining to him in detail his plans for XAI, his new AI startup, where he plans to use data from Twitter, which again, I don't care. He, he's the majority owner, I think, on Twitter. Like uh, I think his other investors should care probably, but... You should the new startup will use data from Twitter and use data from Tesla, the self-driving autopilot data, and um, yeah, spoiler alert by the way for, for the book, and and the use that to create this um, general artificial intelligence. So is he, he says that, but like, okay, is there a deal between Tesla and this new AI startup, which he started? He started by the way. When just after saying that he plans for Tesla to play an important role in in general artificial intelligence, so did he mean is that what he meant by Tesla playing a role? And if he did, okay, is, does Tesla have a share in that company, or is it or is it or getting, that company going to pay Tesla for that data? How is that going to work? Right, and then also uh, the old autopilot guy Carpathy went to OpenAI, like mm-hmm. all all this like incestuous like. AI stuff happening. Like of course, within- Elon doesn't have anything to do with OpenAI uh, right Anywhere. now. Right. But that's a, still a good point because when he left OpenAI, which if you read the book, it's now much more clear that it has to do with uh, he didn't like where OpenAI was going. But officially, what he said is that he left OpenAI because there was a conflict of interest be- between them and what Tesla was doing in artificial intelligence and uh, in recruitment of talent in that space. Well, that just confirms it because Tesla recruited uh, Caperty from OpenAI and now OpenAI recruited Caperty from Tesla. So that was confirmed. And But Elon doesn't seem to care much about conflict of interest when it benefits him. Right. <laughs> so that's... I think that Tesla board, which I have no hope whatsoever, will do anything about it. But if they were good at their, if they if they were truly doing what they're supposed to do, which is look in the interests of the shareholders, they should look into it. A, a full investigation into conflict of interest between Elon and, and Tesla and other companies, and make some clear guidelines about what's going to happen with that. Because I happen to agree that artificial intelligence is um, right now, at a cusp of something great, something extremely impactful. I don't know how much of a role Tesla will play in it, uh, but it does have the opportunity to play a role in it for sure. So if that's the case, then we need some clearer guidelines about how, how this whole thing's going to work. That's, that's where I'm at right now. All right, we have a few more news items to discuss, and then we're going to jump into the comment section. So if you guys have any questions for us, put them in the comment section right now on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. It's going to pop up on our screen here, and we're going to put your comments on the screen and, uh, and answer a question. It can have something to do with what we discussed today or any kind of topic in the EV space you want us, uh, you, you want our take on it. Any questions, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, but uh, let's move into non-Tesla stuff real quick. The Equinox EV, we uh, we might have the best look yet at the actual production version of it uh, because it has uh, it is launching right now in China and China the the MIAT uh, which stands for uh, the Ministry of Industry of Information uh, Technology always always gets um, the specs and and the um, and pictures ahead of time before the for the vehicle to be approved for sales in the in the market and so it comes with a very good look at the at the vehicle here the, the specs you have to be careful like the specs might not be the same as the, the the one in the us but the look should be extremely similar and uh i mean uh, i was already very hyped about the uh, the the latest concept vehicle that came out but this this is this is cool looking yeah i think it's a great looking vehicle um yeah like you said uh 
things vary from China to the U.S., especially in, internally. But uh, it seems like a great car, a good follow-up to the uh, Bolt EUV, maybe. A little mm-hmm. bit bigger, a little bit wider, a little bit longer. It's going to have uh, stuff like uh, vehicle-to-grid. It's going to have Altium faster charging. Uh, mm-hmm. Hopefully, there's some more uh, drive options instead of just front-wheel drive. Um, so, you know, we know that Blazer EV is going to actually have front wheel drive, rear wheel drive and all wheel drive options, which is crazy. Yeah, it's so, exciting. Yeah. Uh, the price is obviously the most exciting, but we, uh, I'm going to be careful about that because, uh, like that $30,000 price tag in the U S I don't, I'm not sure if it's still feasible, uh, with, since all what happened with the dollar and the inflation since it was announced, but it's most likely going to be one of the uh, more most affordable option in the North American EV market soon enough. Yeah, and it's supposed to be out before December, so we'll see if GM can hit their delivery target. Mm-hmm. The Kia Niro EV, uh, we, last week or two weeks ago, we talked about the updated Kona. Now it's uh, the little brother, big brother, uh, non... Uh, uh, Cousin. Yeah, or to, it's like no, it's even more, even closer than that. It's like the twin, but like, what was it when the twin is not the same? Doesn't look exactly the fraternal. same. Fraternal, fraternal twin, yeah. exactly. So it's a fraternal twin of the Kona. Now that gets updated, a um, little bit more range, uh, slightly updated look. Again, still that uh, damn ridiculous front, uh, front charger. But uh, so, what is that actually? That's an adapter. Yeah, so it's, it's that bidirectional charging thing. Yeah, that's but that's you have a plug. Stuff. You have a plug directly on the adapter. That's pretty cool. Yep, I haven't seen that before. Um, yeah, the look is uh, is pretty good. Like, uh, I always like the Nero a little bit more than the Kona personally. Uh, they're not having. They don't have all wheel drive options. I really think that uh, they're missing the boat on that. It's not super yeah. expensive, Dad. All wheel drive, and I think that'd be really. You know something that people in the north would would enjoy. Yeah, they still have the same battery packs, but uh, a little bit more efficient this time. The winds start at thirty nine thousand six hundred, so that's pretty good. Unfortunately, these are not uh, federal tax credit. Uh, worthy lease them. Yeah, we have to lease them. And Toyota is uh, teasing a new, a uh, little bit more smaller, a compact SUV. So if you, if you see that new concept uh, this week, uh, so it's a BZ compact SUV, the BZ4X. Uh, the design cues are pretty clear. It's very similar, mm. but uh, apparently a little bit smaller. I mean, it looks super good in these these images, but... Uh, oops. But... Um, yeah, it's it's still very much a concept. So, what is that? Most of the video has nothing to do with. The There's car. no car in there. <laughs> yeah, it's the other images that uh, here. There you go. <coughs> Those but are it's super perfect. super concepty right now. Yeah. All right, so we jump into the comment section. Yep. All right. Uh, regarding the Model Y in Texas, uh, Rodrigo uh, Jimenez says it might be supply chain issues. I think we talked about that a little yeah. bit. But like, if you have supply chain issues, why can you make them in Fremont and not Texas? Yeah, yeah and why would you remove it completely too? Like, why, why, why can you not keep taking orders? That's that's the biggest concern I have. All right, Spikes forty three question: Any insight on what makes the Cyber Cell different than the Model Y? 4680 cell do you think they had to retool the line to make the 4680 cyber cell and not model y 4680 i don't think there's a difference is there maybe the path yeah i don't think there is uh an intended difference between the two but we know that the 4680 cell is not yet where they want it to be meaning that they keep introducing improvement to it like the what what was announced originally in 2020 when they unveiled the 4680 that was like the aspiration of like when we were full ramp up production. This is the the best sell. So people think sometimes like that. Oh, like the, the prototype is going to be better than the production uh, 
because like you can make like a great prototype, but then you you find in in the production process you find limitation. The the other way around is true too, where you end up finding ways to make the product better at higher volume, investing in different technology. Uh, so as they ramp up production of 46 cd they actually are improving the product itself uh, with the cell. So you might get better cell in the cyber truck than you do in the 4680 model Y. It's not because they are reserving the better cell for the cyber truck, but more because they have made improvements since I think the same cells, if they can, will also make it into the model Y. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Sean Goggin. Tesla is using the barcode uh, Hertz access for its loaner cars. I was using it with multiple loaners end of August. That um, makes sense. Yeah. 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 Put it for their service vehicle. Put it put it for the test drive vehicles. Put it for put it for everything. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. That makes a ton of sense. All right. Uh, regarding the glass house, the guy's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. He can build 100 glass houses. Uh, stop spoiling the book. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, there's lots more tall tales in the book. Uh, Kadar PR says, you are wasting your time by concentrating on trivial personal issues of Elon. That's true, except that trivial personal issues of Elon affect the companies that he deals with, specifically Tesla. Yeah, and I'm not sure it's like conflict of interest between the CEO of Tesla and other companies is a trivial personal issue that I kind of, it's business. It's very much a business issue. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's nothing personal about it. I don't have any personal. Yeah, we're not talking about his like wives. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not children. get into his very could, complex there, family and, and there's his love a big life. rabbit hole we could go down. Yeah. That, it, it, we're not going to spoil the book about that. You can read the book and get all of that stuff in there. All right. Carl in San Diego. I like front wheel drive only for Equinox to help reset the U.S. market over fascination with all-wheel drive for most EVs, for almost all driving, all-wheel drive is just wasteful for efficiency, resources to build, and cost. I, I agree, I, actually. I feel like Carl is probably in a warm climate like San Diego. Uh, I don't know why I get no, that, well, I I mean, that obviously, vibe. Obviously, he is. But, I mean, even here in Quebec, like most of the time, like you don't need all-wheel drive. Even even in the, even in, um, in the winter, like... You, obviously, like if you're, and I know people that are nervous about like driving in the in the snow and all that, and and all-wheel drive reassures them a lot. That's great. Like I understand that, but from day-to-day -day driving, like you, for the most part, you like you don't need it unless like you live in. Like my parents are a good example. Like my my parents are like, oh, we need all-wheel drive. We need all-wheel drive, absolutely. And like my mother is a little bit nervous about driving the winter. Like that makes sense for that. But the real, the only real reason they need it is their driveway is insane. Like they have a, a very steep driveway, and in the winter, yeah, it gets frozen. And if you don't have all-wheel drive, even if you have all-wheel drive, it gets. But that's that's a point. Even if you have all-wheel drive, it can be difficult to get off of it. So for the most part, you just don't need all-wheel drive. The roads they get clear by the, the, the snow plows, uh, and if they don't get clear by the snow plows, even with your all-wheel drive, unless you have like a lifted-up pickup or something, like you, it's not a great situation. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. I used uh, the ID4. We got one in a snowstorm, and I couldn't get up my driveway with the rear-wheel drive version. So, but you know, my wife was like, "Yeah, well, we can get one of those, but it has to be all-wheel drive." And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, "Yeah, I guess for this, you know, we we kind of proved, but you know, 360 days a year." We don't need all-wheel drive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, one interesting thing uh, GM showed us at that that battery day that happened like right before the uh, COVID, um, they they showed us these very low power uh, motors that they said they were going to make uh, what would normally be uh, rear-wheel drive cars. They were going to put these like you know fifty horsepower, not even like really low power uh, motors on the front wheels of some of their cars. So that they could be all wheel drive, but they would be they wouldn't be activated until the winter or you know whatever, so they wouldn't hurt the efficiency. They were kind of just like they were almost Did like they tell you how how much they weigh. Uh, they were really small. I mean, they, yeah. they remind me when, of... when you say really small, like what do you think? Because they you can get like a pretty small like hundred kilowatt motor these days. Like yeah, no, it was it was more like the power output was really small. I think it was only like fifty kilowatts. Uh, or maybe even less and it was um it was like only for vehicles that are you know it was basically like look we can 
make a we can make an EV all wheel drive from a rear or front wheel drive version for under a thousand dollars. So like yeah, that not, makes sense. Why not have that option? Yeah. So maybe we'll start seeing some of those come along. Yeah, yeah, that that that, that would make sense. And like you said, it, but it, it would actually be interesting. Like it would be a, a good. Um, Buying like thinking exercise for people that buy all-wheel drive vehicles, where like okay, you have this option, cost a thousand, two thousand dollars, whatever. You can upgrade to all-wheel drive. It's a super small motor all-wheel drive. It only it's it literally only gonna work for the, those small occasions, those rare occasions where you do need it when you do need a little bit more traction to, to get up um, a, a high C hill or whatever. Is it worth the two thousand dollars for the few times you need it? Like that, that's that's like as clear of a decision that you can make. And I'm right. sure a lot of people will do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Aldi Eid uh, from General Motors, it seems like. Thank you for continuing to pro provide EV news and commentary. Great podcast. Chevy Equinox EV is a game changer starting at $30,000 US dollars, if that happens. We need to give GM credit for their transformation commitment on the path to 100% LD EV by... 2035 with billions of dollars already committed this sounds like an ad the <laughs> transformation in this industry takes time headwinds batteries minerals is real so let's not put blame on gm should the milestones uh pan out it's not for a lack of trying thank you i i feel like so we, should, we need to give them credit but also not criticize them not blame them if it were if it doesn't work i don't know about that like uh, I like. I like. You're, you're right. Like the the Equinox, if it if it comes anywhere near thirty thousand dollars, it's gonna be a winner. Uh, I, I'm all about giving GM credits when you need to, but also, Seth and I have been in the EV game a long time. Uh, we we know that the, 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 all the EV skeleton in, in GM uh, GM's closet. Like we know where they're buried. Uh, like the also, EV one. Is still go, fresh in my mind. <laughs> I mean, go to any GM dealer now. Like, there's no EVs on the lot. Yeah. Like, talk when when we're gonna be thankful for G, what GM's done. They're gonna have a bunch of EVs on the lot. And exactly. Not, not until that point. Yeah. We we still like. We, I mean, there's no bigger fan in the world of the Bolt than 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 Set. But like, we're also very aware that these came out with that in 2016, and then didn't came out from anything until. <laughs> Until now, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, there's like, well, you you could you could still until like at the end of this year, really, because the Cadillac Lyric is low volume. The Hummer EV is low volume. Yep. See those Equinoxes and Blazers. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Carl in San Diego. Cars like the EV6 begin to persuade buyers into all-wheel drive to get the highest set of features. Sad to see folks buying it despite never using it here in SoCal or the South. Yeah, I think if you don't have winter, there's no real reason. Anyone know if there's a straightforward way to ask for charge point operators to install in a mid-sized town? Um, I think I think uh, some of them have these like request location thing. Like I think if you go charge point have those. Uh, Tesla even uh, at least at one point had one. I'm sorry. I mean they still do their quarterly um, like request a supercharger location thing where you can vote on them. Uh, so so yeah, there's there's some options for that. By the way. Uh, Supercharger in Bennington, Vermont. If anybody at Tesla is watching, we need one. Right. Go vote. Boy. I mean, you can you can get. I that do every time. Uh, every time. You, <laughs> you can just write an article on Electric and let people vote on on it. And uh, yeah, that's true. Win it. I feel like we. I feel like last time we talked about it, I was like, everybody go vote for Bennington. But yeah. all right, uh, Rich Tier. Uh, LOL at Carl's comment. Try living in a place with snow and mountains. All-wheel drive is handy, but agree it's not necessary. Our Model Three is real-wheel drive. But I'd prefer all-wheel drive. I live on a mountain. Uh, then yeah. don't don't lot of this comment. Then that you basically agree with this comment. Like most people don't need it. Some people like you do need it. So it's nice that you have the options. <laughs> that yeah. simple. Uh, I was asked by a lot owner how to invite the big players to consider an installation. Thinking DC fast chargers to serve renters. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you can just buy them. Like you can. Buy them yeah. and put them in if you're if you're a lot owner. Yeah, um, they're gonna sell it to you. Yeah, and then Nico loves bacon. That's I think that's we can important. all agree on that. That's uh, <laughs> a good way to end the show. Yeah, who doesn't love bacon? Well, a lot of people actually, but or actually they we really kind of heat it. But Veggie whatever. bacon. Yeah, uh, Canadian bacon is also a thing. Like, well, uh, ham. We call that ham. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Well, appreciate everyone for listening to the show this week. Uh, if you do enjoy the show, please give us a thumbs up, a like, a subscribe, uh, hit that notification button to know when we are back on. And if you're listening to your podcast app, give us a five-star review. We appreciate every single one of you. Have a good weekend.